I recently read the latest edition of Fred Harrison's book called Boom Bust. Edition 2 was published in November 2007 and is subtitled House Prices, Banking, and the Depression of 2010. In this video I will do my best to employ the cycle to understand developments through the last 18 years. I will use my own words and my own memories of historic price moves since I lived in the UK for almost the entire cycle. If you want to know more about cycles before 1990, then get the Boom Bust book. You can also learn more about the land-based theory of economic cycles by reading another book by Harrison, Ricardo's Law, that was published in 2006. As I have said, 14 years is the usual length of the major up phase of property prices. After this, there is normally a four-year downwards correction, making a total of 18 years in the typical cycle. But let's go deeper. Harrison breaks those first 14 years down into smaller components. In fact, he describes a total of five phases over the full 18 years. And I will now turn to look at those individual phases. In considering the cycle, I will remind viewers that the previous UK property cycle peaked about 19 years ago in summer 1989. At that time, a final burst of buying killed the cycle off as people sought to get into the property market before a deadline and then suddenly after the deadline they stopped buying. The tax law was changing so that those that were unrelated by blood or marriage and wanted to get favorable tax treatment of interest could only get it if they bought quickly enough. They had to buy their property before August 1989. Therefore many eager buyers rushed into the market in June and July and their buying pushed prices up to an unsustainable level. By the fall of 1989 it was clear that the market had peaked and be prices began a long slide. Over the next four years nominal prices fell by as much as 8 percent in a single 12 months period with an overall fall of about 30 percent in real terms during the entire four-year correction. Harrison believes the next downturn could be even more severe than that because the current 14-year upswing was far bigger than the one in the pre prior cycle. A bigger boom will mean a bigger bust. Let's start from the last cyclical low. In the recovery phase, which lasts about seven years, prices stop falling. As this phase progresses, expectations change and optimism returns. The most recent cycle started two years apart in 1992 in the US and in 1994 in the UK. Prices rose in this phase by more than 60 percent for the UK as a whole and this was nothing like as much as we saw in the latter half of the cycle. But after a good seven-year run the recovery period was beginning to end in both countries as the global economy slowed down and the US looked to be headed into recession by late 2000. Now the next phase is called mini recession and it's a pause of several months in between two upswings. The recession can come at the end of the first seven years or just at the beginning of the second seven years and the function of the correction is to test and temper optimism generated in the recovery phase. The slowdown may also bring lower interest rates and that will typically breathe new life into a property upswing. Some may recall that the U.S. elected a new president, George W. Bush, in late 2000, and he called for an immediate tax cut to forestall a U.S. recession. The U.K., which was behind the U.S., would likely have followed the U.S. into a downturn. But a few decisions prevented America's brief recession from spreading to the U.K. The first thing was that the aforementioned tax cuts in the U.S. helped to prop up spending. Another thing was 9-11. After the attack on the U.S., Fed Chairman Greenspan did not want the stock market's dot-com bust to spread into the general economy. Americans decided it was their patriotic duty to go on buying. And Greenspan helped them by pushing interest rates down to below 2%. Low rates in the U.S. spread globally and proved to be a shot in the arm for the global property market. The new low rates brought a new eagerness to buy into the property market and kicked off the second part of the upswing. In the UK there was never much of a dip at all, not even enough to be called a recession. 
Now, early in his time as chancellor, Gordon Brown had famously proclaimed an end to boom and bust, so he was keen to avoid a recession and protect his chances of becoming prime minister. As Fred Harrison put it, quote, while Gordon Brown preened himself with declarations about his virtuous prudence in handling the public finances, he sanctioned private binging that undermined the culture of thrift. Britain's consumers would spend, spend, spend the economy out of recession before anyone noticed. Between 1999 and 2000, consumption grew twice as fast in the UK as gross domestic product. An unsecured consumer debt rose at an average rate of nearly 11% in the five years to 2004. This rapid spending drove up the value of sterling, increased debt, but hit manufacturing, which did indeed suffer a recession. However, Gordon could tell voters that the overall economy avoided a downturn. However, this was thanks to a big surge in debt. Massive global liquidity, money supply growth, and inexpensive imports from China helped to keep inflation down while interest rates remained at a low level. The growth in money supply set a stage for the next upswing in property prices. Phase 3, Harrison calls the explosive phase, and I call it the takeoff phase. It lasts about seven years altogether and includes, right at the end, another period, the winner's curse, which I'll talk about shortly. Now, once the recession is done, economic growth takes off and land prices accelerate. Wages grow and house prices rise much faster, with land rising faster still. Rapid house price appreciation typically brings warnings from the government and others that the economy is getting overheated. But everyone's enjoying the high rate of growth and no one wants to do too much about it. Speculative activity meantime picks up and people begin to treat houses as, as an investment rather than just a place to live. Greed eventually overwhelms fear and the main fear is that of being left off the ladder. The center part of the cyclical upswing was 2002 to 2004, when prices rose sharply throughout the UK. In only seven years, from late 2000 to 2004, average prices in England and Wales rose by 71.4%. Midway through, by 2002, people were already talking about high price-to-income ratios in London and a pro and a possible housing bubble. But such talk was easily dismissed as people sought new ways to define housing affordability. During this period, rapid price rises were permitted by the banks, perhaps even encouraged by them. They pushed up the multiples of income that they were willing to lend to far beyond the historic 3 to 1 ratio. By 2005, banks were lending 4.5 to 5 times income. The big surge in mortgage lending, which accompanied this rise, was aided by innovations like interest rate mortgages. And some got past the income multiple restrictions altogether by using a new type of self-certified loan documentation, the so-called liar loans. The final component of the upward phase is called the winner's curse period, and it typically lasts for about two years. This stage is driven almost entirely by enthusiasm for capital gains, the motive to speculate on the potential for huge windfall gains, as Harrison puts it. Investors become reckless, and the winning buyer is typically the one who has made the greatest error in their assessment of what a property is worth. The psychology is primitive. Property must be acquired at any price. Banks encourage the boom by lending higher multiples of income, and their losses in the last cycle are by now completely forgotten. In the market for houses in Britain, the winner's curse is signaled by the advent of gazumping. The winner's success is a curse on him and everyone else because the price is unsustainably high. 